series convergence. The bane of existence of most every BC calculus student, and trust me when I say teacher alike. It's the kind of thing that makes it very difficult for a student and a teacher to wanna to get up in the morning and come to school, let alone learn more mathematics and learn more calculus. But fear not our young Padawans because Brian and I are going to demystify this contemptuous topic and we're going to make it a little bit easier for you to face that morning sun, get into your school and learn more about this really wonderful topic that sheds a whole lot of light around why we study series in the first place. So what are we gonna to learn today? Well, believe it or not, everything you need to know or most everything that you'll need to know to be successful on the AP exam about convergence tests. So we're gonna jump right into it. We've got lots of examples that we're gonna look at today. Uh, Brian has really worked up some wonderful problems, so let's get to it. Our first free response question. We're gonna consider this very interesting series, the summation as n goes from one to infinity of n squared over the quantity two n to the p power times x plus five to the n. We know that p is a constant. Lots of different parts that's going to invoke a lot of these different series tests. And we're going to talk about each one individually. We'll certainly focus on the ones that we feel are going to show up a little bit more frequently on the AP exam. And we'll talk about certain conditions that they have to follow first. And so stay tuned because we've got a lot of great things coming towards your, your way. So what are we going to start with? Well, I'm going to go ahead and do parts a and B of this problem. So part A, if we read this carefully, it says we're gonna let P equal three and we're gonna let X equal negative six. Let's determine if this series is absolutely convergent, conditionally convergent or divergent. And we need to give a reason for our answer. We need to show work that will substantiate those findings. Well, the very first thing that we wanna do is we wanna get into our problem. We wanna get into our series because this problem is really well written in that it can vary so much depending on what our value of P and potentially X is. So in this particular case, if we know that our P is three, let's use a pretty color, let's use blue. I feel like blue today, I always use blue. So we're gonna say that the summation is gonna start with one and go to infinity, of course, and we're gonna replace the P with a three. And as I do that, I'm gonna go ahead with your permission, maybe simplify on the fly, two to the third will make an eight, and our n to the third will of course be an n cubed. And then it says that the x is defined to be negative six. And so negative six plus five of course is negative one, and we have that raised to the n power. And so you see we've kind of moved out of this power series idea into a very specifically defined series. That series is known as an alternating series. If we wanna clean this up a little bit, it doesn't take much to do so. We would maybe float our negative one to the end. I like to call that the alternating component. The alternator sometimes is another good word for it. And then we have one over eight times n. Now, we have to recognize that this is an alternating series. That's very important because that's gonna really take you on a path that's very sort of independent of a lot of the other series tests. And there's a couple of different ways that you can go about determining absolute convergence, conditional convergence, or divergence. I feel like I've tried them all with my students. I've used a couple of different uh, methods um, in the same year with different populations of students to kind of gauge uh, what some of their uh, uh, interests and, and, and feelings are. And I find that a lot of times if I jump right into the absolute value of the nth term expression, my students tend to have a little bit more success. Now, let me tell you what I mean by this. We're gonna go ahead and look at the absolute value of this nth term expression while it still resides in the summation. And of course, what that's going to do is basically eliminate the alternating component. And we're just left with one over eight times n. You could think of that as the constant one eight times the one over n. And I hope that we realize something very immediate about this particular series. This series diverges. 
It's actually called the divergent harmonic series. One over N is a very special series that plays a lot of roles throughout, not just mathematics, but music as well. So we have this divergent harmonic series. Now, what that means is we have lost any chance of absolute convergence. I mean, let's think about it. If you've got this piece of your problem that says you're divergent, that can't be good for convergence. And so here's what I like to do. This is a, a little chart that I give to my students here. Just kind of move some of this writing out of the way. We know that we're divergent. I like to test the series, first of all, with the absolute value. Based on that result, just placing absolute values around that expression, if I have diverges as my result, I'm going to take the right path, which basically says you have to test the series originally to see if it potentially could conditionally converge, or it might be the worst kind of series of all and diverge. Now, if by some chance I had a convergent result from that absolute value test, then I know that my original series is absolutely convergent. And that's typically going to make the problem move pretty quickly because you don't have to test anything else. So notice I have followed this pathway. So that just means I got a little bit more work to do. And so what is this test that I'm going to apply to the original series? Well, it's called the alternating series test. So remember, we said that this diverges. And so if I use the alternating series test, I'm going to just abbreviate that for the purpose of the video as AST. I know that there are two conditions that must apply. Condition number one, we know that the limit as n approaches infinity of the non-alternating component of your series, which if I highlight that, that's this guy right here. That's our good friend, the one over eight times n we know that that has to be zero in order for us to have convergence. And sure enough, a fairly easy limit to see, hopefully, that you get zero. But there's a second test. And the second test is just basically stating that this expression, and you could write it so many different ways, one over eight times n, you could think of it as the sequence, right, with the, with the bracket, uh, the braces around it. You have to have very strong evidence that those terms will decrease in size as n goes from one to two and three. And you really don't have to prove that so much. It's going to be something more or less that you can state. Um, if you have to prove it, there's a variety of ways that you can, you can uh, inject some of that uh, uh, mathematics to, to make that the case. But generally speaking, it's going to be pretty obvious if you've got something that's going to either increase or decrease. And by virtue of both of those being true, that means that the alternating series test does apply, does work, does give us a favorable response. And we can say that we now conditionally converge. And that's our part A. Let's take a look at what part B says. We're still in our original series, but now we're going to let P equal two. It's known that the resulting series converges to four. Let's find the value of X and of course show the work that leads to your answer. Now, one of the things that we've emphasized, Brian's done a really good job of talking about a lot of series today that have a definitive value to which they converge. That's basically saying, if you were to add all of the terms in this series, you will get an answer. That's what convergence means. Well, there aren't a whole lot of series that you can just add up infinitely and get an answer to. And in fact, there's really only two, and one of which is tested on the BCT exam. And so whenever you see language like this, you want to really use the idea of the geometric series. Telescoping series is another series that does that, and it's a great series to study, but it's not going to be covered on the BC calculus exam. And so we're going to take this idea of the geometric series and we're going to move with it. Well, let's go ahead and let P equal two to get things started. So we have our summation, n squared over 
two n to the uh, second power. So if you'll allow me, I'm going to go ahead and simplify and get four n to the second power. And then we have our x plus five to the n here. All right, so now we have this new series that, that's uh, come about with that value of p. And very quickly we see, oh, of course those n squareds are going to cancel away. And we come up with this. And you might notice that this bears a nice resemblance to a series that hopefully you've studied a little bit along the way called the geometric series. It has that a, it, it has that, that constant that sometimes we refer to as A times some quantity to the n power, where that quantity R uh, can serve as our common ratio. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that formula. And sometimes that formula can get us into trouble. Maybe you've seen this formula before, um, something like A1 or A over one minus R. And a lot of times when we memorize uh, when we memorize formulas, we don't tend to really understand what the pieces in the formula really mean. And so I really like for this A1 to be thought of as the first term. And I think it's something that we talked about even in a video last week. All right, so don't always assume that that first term might be that constant that's out in front, because I don't think that that is going to be the case for this particular problem because our n starts with something besides zero. So if we use that idea, if we use that fact, our first term when n is one is going to be x plus five to the first over four. So we start with that as our numerator, divide that by one minus the value of r, which is going to allow x plus five to take on that role, Make sure you use parentheses around that because you are subtracting this quantity. And then all of this is supposed to equal four, which is what our sum was going to be. And so now we just need to clean this up a little bit. So, uh, boy, this, this, thing, this thing needs a good bath, doesn't it? So we'd have say x plus five over four. Uh, maybe in this denominator, I could distribute that negative sign. And what would I have here? Negative x minus four. All of that's equivalent to four still. At this point, we could cross multiply. The x plus five over four is going to be equivalent to negative four x minus 16, I believe. Multiply a four over to the other side, just a little bit of algebra here to get us going. I think we get negative 16 x minus 64, hopefully. And now if we solve this for x, we can add 16x over to the left to get 17x, subtract five from negative 64, and our final answer is going to be negative 69 over 17. And that's that value of x that will work to ensure that this series is going to converge to four, that it's going to have a sum that adds to four. We're going to skip part C for this problem. It's a wonderful part that, that talks about the idea of the interval of convergence. We're going to see some more problems in the, broad, in the video here that's going to focus on that idea. So you're going to see it, but we certainly would like to assign this one for homework and let you kind of work on that one uh, on your own. But Brian, I believe, is going to take over now, and he's going to wrap up question one doing part D. Brian. Perfect. Thanks, Tony. Great job on the part A and B, like Tony said, check out part C and we'll see a similar question here um, in a few moments. So you can still get some practice with that. So we're going to jump ahead to part D and I went ahead and wrote something down, spoiler alert, but uh, I've noticed over the you know, last few weeks and last few years that um, when I write quickly, my handwriting looks like nothing. And when Tony writes quickly, it looks like you're typing in Microsoft Word all of a sudden. Like, I don't know what happens, but my handwriting is garbage and Tony's handwriting is perfect. So I thought I'd maybe preempt something here. So uh, part D, uh, we still have the same kind of stem, right? But now we're looking at uh, a couple more things. X is gonna be negative six. And then we don't really have a P value. It just says P is greater than two. That's all we know, P is greater than two. And the alternating series air bound, okay, guarantees that the sum of the first four terms of the series will approximate F of negative six to within one sixteenth find P. And so, the key here is realizing sometimes you'll see a question and it will just 
ask you to find the air bound. And here, uh, they just tell you what the air bound is, right? So it's the same idea, but kind of in reverse a little bit. But the key idea is you start talking about series that are alternating. Uh, we have this alternating series air bound as long as the series converges. Um, on the exam, if you're doing convergence, whether you're doing a Taylor series or a Taylor polynomial um, approximation, or you're doing just a series question like this, we always have this idea of it converges. Like Tony said, you know, these series converge because that equals a number, but we rarely ever ask, what does it converge to? Like, yeah, there's an answer. What is it? I don't know. Don't care. Move on, right? And so even though we don't actually find what the answer is, we are interested in knowing if we added up the first three or four terms or the first four or five terms, is that answer even close to the real answer? Like we know that if we went forever, there's an answer. Well, we don't have time for that, right? Literally. So if we add up a few terms, how many would I have to add up to get a decent approximation? And so in some cases we can do that. Now we won't ever know the actual error, right? So let's not confuse that we're not finding the error. If we found the error, then why are we approximating it, right? We would just add it. Like if I said, my answer was four, but I know that I'm one less than the real answer. Well, then tell me your answer is five, right? The air bound is just telling us, I got this answer. I know it's not right probably because I'm adding more terms, but I know that it's at least this good. Like worst case scenario, I'm no worse than this far off. And that's what an air bound does. And if a series alternates, we can use the alternating series air bound uh, to help you know, round that up. If a series is not alternating, we do have an option uh, with Lagrange air bound, right? Which is a very similar idea to the alternating series air bound because they both um, kind of focus around a big theme of the next term, right? And so if we do an alternating series air bound, the, the alternating series air bound says for an alternating series that converges, you know, meets all the conditions, the terms approach zero and they're decreasing, the error, how far off you are by adding two, three, four, five, six terms is always less than the next term that you would have added. So wherever you stop adding terms up, whatever one you left out, the very next one that would have been up next, that number, that value is how far off you could possibly be overall. It's pretty remarkable. And when you look at Lagrange air bound and how ugly that formula is and how like, you know, confusing it might look on the surface, it's really a similar idea that with Taylor polynomials who may not be alternating all the time, it can be applied on a more broad scale using Lagrange, meaning it works for any series, right? Uh, you know, any Taylor series. So it's, but it's still based on that next term. So here we go. We've got this little uh, message right here and we're gonna solve this. And so we know that uh, X is negative six and P is greater than two. So I really can't plug anything in for P because we don't know what P is in this case. So we wanted to give you an example where you don't really have a number to plug in but we have something like this. And X is gonna be negative six. If I plug that in, uh, it just becomes negative one to the N. And that's where we get the alternating part. That negative one to the N gives me this alternating component. And we're trying to approximate this using the first four terms. So S sub N is what our approximation would be. It'd be in this case, it'd be S sub four, right? That's our approximation. If we added up the first four terms, we don't even have to do that. Sometimes the exam will say, like approximate this using the first four terms and you would write them out one by one and add them up or at least write them out. We don't have to do that. But whatever we would get for that minus S, the true value, right? S is just kind of like the, the true answer. The difference of those two things is gonna be our error, right? If you take what you came up with with your approximation and you subtract what it should have been and take the absolute value, meaning it doesn't matter if you're too high or too low, you're just wrong but that air bound is always less than the next term. And in this case, the next term would have been the fifth term, right? If you're using the first four terms starting at n equals one, we're gonna be adding up, you know, a sub one, a sub two, a sub three, a sub four, and stop. So the next one would have been the fifth term. So all we have to do is find the error, right, of the fifth term. So what I'm gonna do, is just go ahead and kind of work this out. And in this case, they actually gave us the air bound. See, normally you are plugging in the fifth term and finding the air, but now we're we're given the air bound. So we'd have one sixteenth. that's our air bound, right? It's gonna be less than, in this case, uh, what do we have? A sub five, we're gonna get five squared because N is five in this case, right? We're using five for our N value here. So it's gonna be the fifth term. So N is five. 
over 10 to the p, because 2 times 5. And then we still have our negative 1 to the fifth power. And just like before, everything is going to have absolute values, because we don't really care whether they're positive or negative. We're just trying to say, like, magnitude, right? The overall value of this, regardless of too high or too low. So we're going to take absolute values of these. And I would have technically have one on the other side, but uh, in this case, the 1 16th is already positive. So that means that our error is going to be less than uh, whatever this math is. This seems like some numbers. Uh, what is that, 25 on top and maybe 10 to the p on the bottom? And negative 1 to the fifth is negative 1, but we're doing absolute value, so it just kind of goes away. And then if I kind of solve this problem, I'm going to multiply across a little bit, and we get uh, 10, not to the p, 10, I mean, yeah, 10 to the p, not 10 times p, 10 to the p is less than whatever 25 times 16 is, and that seems like 400, probably. 25 times 16, 16 quarters is like $4, right? That's probably 400. And now, not to make a mistake, it'd be easy here to just divide by 10 out of instinct. You see the 400, you see the 10, that's pretty appetizing. Uh, not quite what we want. Uh, and so basically, we're gonna have this idea of 10, to the p power is 400. Um, I'm, I'm going to make these equal in this case because we're going to solve this problem. But to solve this problem, uh, we're going to write this in log form, right? Exponential problem. So this means that log base 10, in this case, of 400 is going to be our p value in this case. So uh, our p value ends up being like log of 400. What a weird number. If you type that on a calculator, uh, on the AP exam, we know you cheated because it was a no calculator problem. How did you do that? Uh, but two, um, it's not going to be a nice number. It's a decimal, right? It's going to be some transcendental, non-repeating, irrational number. And it's a really good point to point out that when you see series problems, the n that we see in the problem, those have to be whole numbers, right? Like n's, when you're doing a summation, you know, n is one, and then two, and then three. You can't plug in non-whole numbers. But if you're doing a P series, P is any constant, right? A constant doesn't mean it has to be a whole number. It just means it's going to be a number, right? A real number. So I think sometimes we do things like P series. We tell students, oh, you know, if P is greater than one, the series converges. And then all of a sudden you see a problem with like 1.1 for P. And some of my own students in the past have gotten a little bit confused because they're like, well, I mean, is it more than one? And they know it's more than one, right? They're, they know under, they understand that. But when they think in their brain, you know, p greater than one, they're thinking the next number is two. Because when you do a series a lot, you use whole numbers. But uh, for p values, it's any number bigger than one, a p series converges. 1.1 is bigger than one, it would converge. And so uh, our p values don't need to be whole numbers. It can be anything, um, you know, anything where it's going to be uh, greater than one. So in this case, we end up getting this. And this question that I, I wrote, because of the short turnaround, this was on an AP exam. Uh, the college board would do a much better job being a little bit more distinct with the wording. So in theory, I could pick any value bigger than what I chose and the air bound would still be less than 1 16th. You know, the, the higher we go up there, the, the better the answers we're going to get. Um, but here, the alternate series air bound itself says the air is less than 1 16th. So they might make that a little bit more clear in their wording that we're looking for that exact value um, not just give me all the p values where it is within 1 16th. The fact is the alternating series air bound states for this p value, the air is less than 1 16th. If you picked a bigger p value than this, then the alternating series air bound would have guaranteed it was within a different number, a more accurate number. So of course, other p values would be more accurate, but this is the one that the alternating series air bound uh, would state. So there we go, a little bit of an air bound question. So we're going to jump to FRQ number two, and this is the, the question itself. It's much simpler STEM, right? The, the STEM is just the information before you get to part A, B, or C. So here we have A sub N is two A sub N minus one over three for all you computer science uh, students out there as well. You see some recursive things happening there. And then your B sub N is N minus one factorial over four to the N. And so we got two different things. That's all we're told. So I'm going to leave out part A and leave that for you. It's another good radius of convergence problem that you can try on your own because I want to focus on part B, right? And so we're going to do part B and part C. So uh, part B, if I jump to this question, 
Uh, this is the same stem we had before, but it says, let h of x equal this series. And notice we have our b sub n in there. Uh, find the interval of convergence. And so remember, when you're doing a series problem, if it asks you for the radius of convergence or the interval, either one, your first instinct should probably be the ratio test. The only exception to that would be if you happen to notice that it's a geometric series, that's got a much quicker way to check, right? For a geometric series, we know that R, the absolute value of R is less than one. We can do that immediately. Um, you could do the ratio test, but it's unnecessary. Or if it's a known series like sine or cosine, we know what the interval is already. But in general, you should think ratio test. That's kind of how you're going to decode it uh, is through the ratio test. And then Tony is going to show us a multiple choice problem here in a little bit where being a little bit more clever could definitely save you some time on something like this. But find the interval of convergence. Uh, we're going to do the ratio test. And it's important to know with the ratio test, you're not finding the interval. You're finding the radius of convergence. But we have to know that first, right? To find the interval, you have to know the radius. And you have to know the center. And we put those things together and check the endpoints. And that's where our interval comes from. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and plug in this b sub n uh, into the problem. So we have this n minus 1 factorial and then x minus 3 to the 2n over, now we have 4 to the n times n plus 1 factorial. And then n is going from 1 to infinity. And already I'm starting to kick myself for why I make such a complicated question, not realizing I was the one that was going to be doing it. I really thought this would be Tony's question to do, and I didn't think about it, and now I'm doing it. So um, that backfired. I like this problem because, number one, you could just jump into ratio test right away, right? Interval convergence, ratio test. But sometimes in calculus, the trick is realizing don't jump into calculus. Sometimes looking at it first and cleaning things up a little bit, doing a little bit of pre-work before you do the calculus work can usually save you much more time on the end, meaning it's better to clean it up before the calculus. And so if you spend a couple seconds in the beginning, it probably could save you a couple minutes overall. So here, before I start doing the ratio test, I want to clean this up, realizing n minus 1 factorial over n plus 1 factorial, we can always reduce factorials. And sometimes when you have n's involved, it's a little bit more confusing. But the simplest way to reduce factorials is no matter whether it's n or just a number inside of it, it doesn't matter, is start with the larger of the two numbers. And n plus 1 is, I hope we realize, n plus 1 is bigger than n minus 1, right? It's a bigger number. So you start with the larger number, whether it's in terms of n or in terms of just regular you know, constants. And we start counting down. A factorial is that number times the number one less than that. So if n plus one factorial is n plus one times n. That would be one less than n plus one. And then one less than that would be n minus one. And, and we would just keep going down, right? Factorial, you keep multiplying by the number below it. But if you start with the larger number, you can stop as soon as you get to the other number in the problem because it's going to be n minus one factorial because it would just keep going, 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 going. And those two factorials will cancel. And n minus 1 factorial over n plus 1 factorial just becomes 1 over n times n plus 1. So I think if we spend just a few moments cleaning that part up, and sometimes you can clean some other pieces up as well, but it definitely will save you some time with the ratio test. Because now I'm not trying to plug in n plus 1 into all these equations and get confused on the back end. So uh, this whole series turns into x minus 3 to the 2n times or over 4n times n times n plus 1. And now we're ready for the ratio test, right? So the ratio test says, uh, let's just take the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of the n plus 1 term over the general term. So for the n plus 1 term, you just plug in n plus 1 every time you see an n. And most of the time, you don't think about it. But then every once in a while, the college board sneaks in a question like this. and 90% of the country misses it. But you're watching this video because you're a smart person and you're going to be the 10% that gets it right. Because notice here, the big aha moment was the exponent was not n, it was 2n. And so you can't just write n plus 1 everywhere. You have to replace the n with 2n plus 1. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like this, x minus 3. And then if I replace n with n plus 1, it's 2 times the quantity 
n plus 1. That's going to be a very important thing because it will change our answer at the end if you don't catch that. Over 4 to the n plus 1. And then we're going to have some ugly n plus 1 stuff here on the bottom. n becomes m plus 1 here. And then the n plus 1 becomes n plus 2. I'm adding n plus 1 where the n was. So uh, it's a little bit complicated. It looks a little bit ugly, but I tell my students that, um, you know, even ugly babies are loved, right? This is like an ugly baby. Like it's still beautiful to me. So that is the n plus one term. And then we're going to divide that by the current term, which means we're going to multiply by the reciprocal, make it a little bit simpler. So four to the n times n times n plus one. I'll let Tony, Tony chime in in a minute when he comes back on. I don't know if I can say ugly baby on this or not, but we'll find out. So I'm sure I'll get an email from that. And when we get this, and goodness gracious, I don't even know what to do with this. Like Even I'm overwhelmed, like, oh my goodness. Well, the best thing to do is realize when you do this, when you're doing n and n plus one, you're plugging n plus one into the same terms that you have for the general term. So these things are gonna match up. So personally, I like to just do a little bit of rearranging uh, before I reduce, meaning I like to put some things together that are uh, kind of pairing up, meaning the x minus three on top, is going to be x minus 3 to the 2n plus 2 if I distribute that. That's the big important piece. It's not 2n plus 1. It's 2n plus 2 because we're distributing the 2. Uh, and then that's going to kind of pair up with this x minus 3 to the 2n on the bottom, right, that we had there. And then I'm going to put the 4 to the n, the second piece on top, with the 4 to the n plus 1. I just like to pair them up. It helps me see what can reduce. And then all of this other n stuff is kind of like, polynomial looking stuff like if it was x it'd just be like an equation of something uh all that stuff kind of just pairs up together and i want to take the limit of all of that and so we want to reduce it a little bit and man oh man i hope that i can reduce this quickly because i'm realizing i am crunching low on space you ever do that like in a class where you're like running low on space and you start like wrapping around the edges and stuff and i always get on my students for that and then i'm probably gonna be the person that does that here so my students are watching, here most. So x plus, or x minus three to the two n plus two over x minus three to the two n, that's gonna end up being x minus three. And what's the difference between those? Is it just two? It's just squared, right? Because two n plus two on top, two n on the bottom, subtract them, you just get two. And then we're gonna have this four to the n over four to the n plus one is just gonna be over four on the bottom. And then I can't do much with this other stuff. And so I think it's important to realize this, the stuff that looks like a p-series or a polynomial, uh, that stuff you're not going to be able to reduce, generally speaking. I guess I could cancel out the n plus ones probably, right? I guess that is a factor. That does reduce, doesn't it? Oh, man, look at that. I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to show off my, my pen and realize, hey, I can simplify a little bit. Don't expect to simplify that stuff. Usually you can't simplify it. But in this case, since there's two factors, it kind of just worked out. Uh, I'll just pretend like I meant to do that and I planned the problem that way. Like I was a genius or something. So now we want to do this. I like to take the stuff with x and the constant out of the problem. I just prefer to do this because the limit really is only being applied. We have this nice limit property. The limit is only being applied to this n, right? It says n goes to infinity. And so it turns out that the x and the 4 are kind of irrelevant. So I like to pull them out in front. Just don't forget they were in absolute values, right? These are in absolute values. And so now I can evaluate this limit. And so this limit right here is what I'm evaluating. And since we're going to infinity, or kind of, whatever that number looks like on the bottom, I feel like Tony's just judging me as he watches me handwrite. But this n goes to infinity. n over n is just 1, right? The limit of n over n, the ratio is just 1. So we just get 1 for this part. So our actual limit in red is the absolute value of x minus three squared in this case. Wow, what, we're gonna do that square, we'll find out, is this. This is the result of the ratio test. I took the ratio test, I got this. And you're like, well, when I learned ratio test, we were told if it's less than one, it converges. If it's more than one, it diverges. If it equals one, you picked the wrong test. Try something different, right? What is this? Well, we're not asking if the series converges. We're saying, tell me every single number where it converges. So we know it converges. So I can just automatically take this thing and say that this has to be less than one because I want to know when it converges. I'm going to force it to be less than one and see what happens. And then a fun little trick here. 
I am going to multiply both sides by four. Did you know you could do that? You can, you can multiply uh, out of a absolute value. We're always told in algebra, you can't like move things in and out of an absolute value. You can't add things or subtract things in or out, but you can certainly multiply or divide uh, as long as you're not gonna be dealing with any negatives. And so if I multiply by four, I get the absolute value of X minus three squared is less than four. But now we have to take care of this square because the goal that we want with any ratio test is we wanna get it down to X minus C, right? Or the absolute value of X minus C, that's what we want. The absolute value of this thing is less than some number on the right-hand side. If we can get it to this, we have our center and we have our radius, which now will give us the interval. So in this case, we don't quite have this because of the square. So what we can do, I'm gonna square root both sides. So let's do it. So X minus three, if I square root that, is less than two. And is it plus or minus? Well, I hope not, because I hope we don't have a negative radius. Uh, I once played around with some math and geometry. What would happen if your radius was like imaginary? It was pretty fun. So we get this. This is our kind of our final form, which means I know the center is three. And now I have this, the radius must be two. And only if the question had asked for the radius would be done. But there's more. It's like the sham well. There's always more. So what this means is my center is at three, and I can go two in either direction. So if I go to the left two, that's what the radius means. I can go all the way down to one. And if I could go to the right two, I can go all the way up to five, right? That's what we're gonna get. So what's that gonna look like? Well, we get our one and we get our five here. And I'm going straight off my mouse now, just so you know, because if you've been joining us the last couple of weeks, this is like Calc BC Review slash the adventures of Brian's Surface Pro pen. And my pen just froze up again. It's a miracle. I think even my pen gave up from this problem. My pen's like, I'm done, man. Like, this is call it a day, Brian. This is too much. Uh, but we're going to keep going. We're going to press on. We're, we are more perseverant than my, my pen, my $100 pen. So the interval is from one to five. The problem with the ratio test is it's inconclusive at the endpoint. So what do you do? You test the endpoints out. I have to check one and I have to check five. And where am I going to check them? into these series we're going to see what happens right so if x is one what is that going to look like so if x is one uh and then please don't judge my series i'm bad at drawing these things anyway and then i'm drawing on a mouse pad right now that's that's pretty impressive you're probably thinking you're better on that than you are regular but if i plug in x equals one to here we're going to get one minus three inside of there so negative two right negative two here to the two in well, negative two to the two n, right? What does that look like? We're gonna have negative two, and then to the two n is like saying negative two squared, right? To the n power. So we have negative two squared to the n power, which is really a fancy way, that's so bad. Uh, it's really uh, just negative two to the square, which is four, and all of that is to the n power in reality. So it's four to the n power. And what's gonna happen? If I have four to the n on top, and I have a four to the end on bottom, those just cancel. And what am I left with? I'm left with one on the top and I'm left with N. This is a punishment I get for making this long problem and having to do it myself. Punishment fits the crime. Now I'm doing this with a mouse pad. Should be like a virgin mark and just go over there and do uh, the document camera, right? That would've been smart. Well, this series looks kind of weird, right? One over N times N plus one. If you distribute this, right? it becomes n squared plus n on the bottom. And if it's n squared plus n on the bottom, we can do a limit comparison. That's kind of like one over n squared. It's a P-series idea, right? So this would converge by the limit comparison test to the P-series where n is two, that converges. So one converges. And if we try five, we get the exact same thing because five minus three is two and two squared is four and four to the n right on top and we get one and we get the exact same problem. So on this particular problem, if we've checked both endpoints and please don't uh, get mad on the exam. If you don't show your work, guess what's gonna happen? They're going to ding you, right? They wanna see the analysis. And so in this case, because I have a pen that doesn't wanna work with me very well, 
I kind of shortchanged it a little bit, but please on your test, you're going to want to show how you got your answer. You're going to show, you know, at X equals one on the paper and then plug it in like I did and then get an answer and say con converges by the limit comparison to P series and then do the same thing and then write your answer. So our final, final answer for the interval of convergence is one to five inclusive. So I am going to throw it back to Tony, but there are two really good other parts here that I hope you will check out. Part C is a kind of a neat question with recursive with that part from A. Check it out and see, but it does, I'll give you a hint. It connects to what Tony mentioned in one of the parts in FRQ1. So uh, his kind of, he kind of laid some foundation there to give you a hint on, on this question. So we'll do that one. And then we're gonna jump back to some multiple choice. And so Tony is gonna take it over from me and he'll take us through a few really cool multiple choice problems to see how they might look. Sa sounds like a plan, Brian. And I'll tell you what, that was impressive drawing with the mouse. I was, I, I was blown away. I was impressed by that. That's pretty, that's pretty good. And you know what? There, there may be ugly babies, but it doesn't matter because they do all grow up to be beautiful. Just like those of you that are learning calculus, those of you that are teaching calculus, everybody's beautiful, but with the exception of maybe a couple of BC calculus presenters here. And, you know, the only, the only bad grade, the really Worst grade I ever got in my life, penmanship, second grade, D plus. I was on a mission ever since. Thank you, Sister Florence O'Connor. All right, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at some multiple choice. Uh, we're going to start with this question number one. It's got a lot of really neat components to it here. It gives you three series, three very different series, and it asks you which of the following would be conditionally convergent. And the AP exam will often throw these sort of conceptual questions about you know, Roman numeral one, maybe it's Roman numeral one and two, there's different uh, sort of permutations of which ones may fall under this category. And so what we're gonna do um, to maybe streamline the notation a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna call each of these nth term expressions a shorter name, just so that I can refer to them as such. A n, b sub n, and c sub n. Now, again, it's not, a must that you follow the protocol that I had outlined earlier, but a lot of times I like to use the absolute value of the nth term expression first to determine the type of convergence that I have. Some students like to flip that order and do that second, and it works just as well that way uh, uh, as well. So for number one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about, well, what is the limit? Uh, or I'm sorry, not the limit. We're not talking about the limit. What is the summation? of the absolute value of that nth term expression a sub n. Really, what does that do? Well, of course, it's going to do away with the alternating term. We know that, so the negative one to the n will disappear on us. And what I've got left here is uh, something that we can simplify. Brian made a really good point about doing some very light algebraic simplification to really get you into the true series that we want you to see. So this two to the n over three to the n minus one. One way that we could treat that is that three to the n minus one, well, I suppose you could call that three to the n divided by three to the first, all residing there in the denominator, right? Notice the division of the base three will manifest into the subtraction of their exponents. And what that will allow to happen is that this three in the denominator will actually, it's in the denominator of the denominator, it's gonna find its way up in the numerator now. And then I have two to the n over three to the n, which could be very conveniently written as two thirds to the n power. I want you to take that in for a second and think about what kind of series does that look like? And hopefully you're all thinking geometric. That's exactly what it is. And not only is it geometric, it's a convergent geometric because we have an R value here that lies between one and negative one, two thirds. And so because this will converge, that means that um, we have what we call the end all be all greatest kind of convergence ever. And we will have absolute convergence with our overall series. Remember, if the absolute value diverges, that's when you have a little bit more work to do in determining whether you're straight gonna diverge or possibly conditionally converge. And so 
what we are able to do is eliminate three of our choices just with that really good understanding of the absolute value and its role that it plays in determining this uh, conditional convergence. Now, I just really briefly, I wanted to kind of talk about a couple of things with these other two series because they're absolutely fantastic series to still uh, to, to think about here. For number two, if we do the same thing and apply the absolute values, what we have is uh, essentially we're going to have um, uh, one over n plus three, right? one over n plus three. Well, we look at that, we think, wait a minute, that looks a little bit harmonic, right? It can compare to the harmonic, the harmonic series. And so therefore it will diverge. And not only does it diverge, if we continue to investigate the two criteria of the alternating series test, because remember, that's what we have here, we find that that limit is indeed zero as n approaches infinity. And we also find that this nth term expression does decrease in value. In other words, the nth plus one term is going to be um, smaller than the nth term, right? Here's that other way that you can prove that. If you can show that this is true, then you've shown that you have this decreasing um, relationship, the nth plus one term less than the nth term. And if you cross multiply this, it doesn't take very long for you to see, oh yeah, he's not kidding. Um, I think that's a true statement. If I subtract four from, or n from both sides, I'm pretty sure that three is less than four. And so that's why we have this wonderfully divergent, um, I'm sorry, this wonderfully conditionally convergent relationship for two. I would love for you, I'm not gonna talk a, a, a lot about it here, but I would love for you to take a look at three and just basically reinforce why it's not going to be conditionally convergent. I wanna give you a hint. You're gonna use the nth term test, one of the earlier tests that you may have learned, maybe one of the easier tests to apply, but the nth term test becomes really valuable to show that problem, a uh, Roman numeral three won't be part of your answer. So we're going with B, two only. We're going to go ahead and pop on over to problem number, uh, looking at our time. I tell you what, let's pop on over to problem four. Number three is a really good one to look at. Um, it uses the idea of the limit comparison test. If that's something that you're like, man, I forgot what the limit comparison test was. I forgot what a lot of these tests were. One thing that you can certainly do is uh, take a good look at some of the AP daily videos. That will certainly help out. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to let Brian make this wonderful announcement. We're going to have a great resource for you to take a look at. So Brian's going to tell you a little bit about that uh, before we close down. But I wanted to just look at number four because Brian had mentioned about shorter ways to figure out these intervals of convergence without having to take the ratio test. Remember the problem that Brian uh, did in that problem two part B. It was a long problem, but one thing that we know is that if you do the ratio test on the AP exam on an FRQ, you are very typically going to pick up a lot of points. And so you're going to get rewarded for all of those steps. Hopefully your pen doesn't go out in the middle of the test. But what we're going to do here is avoid that very difficult, long, arduous process. And the reason is because in this particular series, we know we are centered at three, very important. So if you can take a look at any of your options and see if any of them don't seem to be centered at three, then we're not even gonna consider them. And as you can look at A and B very, very quickly, a quick inspection, those look to both be centered at zero. And so there's no possible way they can be the correct answer. On the other hand, C and D, when you move from negative one to seven, it's certainly possible that three would be right there in the middle, right? With a radius of four. And so all you have to do now is just worry about checking the endpoints. And so to do that, we'll just very quickly check uh, negative one, and we'll put that inside of the series, replacing our X with that negative one. And so what we would have is negative one to the N times negative four to the n all over n times four to the n minus one. Again, we can clean this up, make this a little bit easier to see. Um, a lot of students don't realize, but what happens if you're multiplying 
unlike bases with like exponents. We don't tend to see that nearly as often as the other way around, but you are allowed to go ahead and multiply those two bases together. We would get a positive four and you just attach that exponent. And as I said before, four to the n minus one, much like the previous problem can be rewritten as four to the n over four to the first. You'll notice that these four to the n's will cancel away. And if you want to maybe multiply by the reciprocal of that four, you're going to find out that it just resides in this numerator above that n. And now you're back to your really good friend, the divergent harmonic series, right? And so we know that we're going to diverge, which means uh, negative one is not going to be a part of this interval of convergence, which pretty much defaults your answer to D. Now, I won't write out the situation when you put when you plug seven in for X, but as you can see, you're not going to have this negative sign right here. Let me just kind of cover that up and you're gonna see a more of a, a straight cancellation, but it's going to leave behind the negative one to the N. The negative one to the N is gonna stick around. And so therefore that harmonic series that we had is now gonna be the alternating harmonic and therefore you're going to converge there. Uh, I'm sorry. Did I say converge? I meant converge, yes. Conditionally converge, but converge is all we need in order to uh, close off that interval at seven. All right, Brian, I'm gonna let you bring us home. Thank you guys for joining us for this entire time. And so uh, what should we take away today? Well, number one, convergence tests is a lot of things and there's a lot of similarities between them. So we have to be very careful about the nuances. You can't sort of half know them, right? So number one, uh, make sure, just on a free response, but you check the conditions. And one of the problems Tony did in the beginning, the FRQ1 about the, the series and how since it won to the sum, we knew it was gonna be geometric. And we sometimes we just apply that formula, right? Well, we have to remember geometric series only work if the R, the ratio is less than one, right? The absolute value is less than one. And so just because you plug a number in, it might give you an answer. That's what we had to check, right? So we had to check to make sure that value actually uh, would make sense with the problem. So always check conditions. Alternating series test has conditions. Integral test has conditions. And so the test is really interested in your understanding of these theorems and how to apply them and these tests and how to apply them. And so uh, I would expect to have one of these at least, alternating series, conditional convergence, integral test, one of these ideas uh, to be on the free response. And one of the things we're looking for is you can't just show me some work and get an answer. You have to show me why you're using it. If I'm going to use the alternating series airbound, did I state or show that the series, you know, the, the terms approach zero and they're decreasing, right? Like we're looking for these uh, conditions. That's gonna be a, one of the points will be tied to those ideas. Uh, and then also know the conclusions, right? P series, P is greater than one, right? But we get to geometric, we want the R value less than one, right? And so there's a lot of ones and back and forth. Can it equal one? Can it not equal one? So you have to really know these ideas. Uh, and then if the terms approach zero, that does not mean the series approaches zero, right? So if the numbers you're adding get closer to zero or approach zero, it could still converge. Case in point, the harmonic series, right? And then finally, if it asks for the sum of a series, what is the sum? Find the sum of a series. That's not one that we already know. Your clue is geometric, like Tony mentioned. So those are some key takeaways. And then the, the nice resource is we have a good friend. You might know him, right? Mark Corrali from, from Denton, Texas uh, is doing the Calc AB videos with our other good friend, Verge Cornelius from Mississippi. And uh, Mark, a couple of years ago, had created a nice little foldable with all the convergence tests and the conditions and conclusions and all that kind of good stuff. And so Mark said, uh, he shared with us on the air today, uh, when we were talking, um, not with us, but in the background, that we can share that. So in the Google Drive where you find the problems, uh, you'll see a nice resource that our, our friend Mark Corrali had made a while back that has everything on one sheet, kind of a nice one handout. Uh, so that'll be up there by tomorrow. Uh, that'll be on Wednesday. So there you go. So thank you guys so much for joining us today. Two more days left, Wednesday and Thursday, and you'll be ready to crush the AP exam. Tomorrow, we're hitting tables and theorems like the Euler's theorem and mean value and uh, IVT, all that good stuff dealing with tables. So uh, don't miss it. And then Thursday, we'll wrap up with everything together so you know you'll be ready for the exam no matter which day you're taking it. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>